So welcome everyone to the fourth talk on this fourth full day of our summer session at Mountain Cloud and in the cloud, in this cloud zendo. Such a wide sky and not the slightest gap. No matter the navigation. We've been inviting, discovering, exploring intimacy with all things in our sitting, walking, meals, work practice, in our sleeping and waking. Even if you haven't experienced what one student called a eureka moment, we are immersed in this intimacy, fully immersed. It's going on all the time. As Dogen put it, manifesting here and now. The koans are full of this intimacy, presenting, manifesting, inducing, as Mumon or Wumin put it in his birthing image, illumining the myriadness in myriad ways, drawing on the family history of encounters to help us taste and see what is right here, right now. Why is that helpful, <laughs> to put it mildly? How can it be so utterly life-giving to drop our assumptions about what we are, about what this life is, and taste this moment? Put another way, why do we practice? Or as Dogen put it, why do we engage in practice realization? This one word, this couplet, this practice awakening right here. On the first day of the retreat, timeless, we were entering into Mu. And we heard Dogen's verse from the Genjo Koan, his famous summary of what this practice is. Here's just the beginning. To study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things. Because the world that we imagine to be out there is actually coming up right here, actualizing you, realizing you. It is you. This one entirety, your whole body. Dogen calls it the true human body. So nearer to the beginning of this Ginjo koan, this remarkable essay, Dogen writes, when the self advances and confirms the myriadness of things that is illusion 
when the myriadness of things, the 10,000 things, advance and confirm the self, that's realization. Dogen is describing his experience and saying what this reality is. And keep in mind, he says, your body and mind will drop away of itself and your original face will appear. Already so. That's what this is. Fallen away. Fallen away. Dogen's essay ends with a koan and a turn toward suffering toward why we do this practice. The last line is a poetic turn. So I think yesterday in, in this sweep of vast time, at some point Henry speaking about Dogen, it was a Q&A responding to a question. You know, how do we read Dogen? It's so difficult and yet compelling in a way and and within his response Henry said you know Dogen just sort of moves between these kinds of language between analysis and philosophy and poetry somehow you may find it deeply touching even if we can't quite fathom the language. So after laying out in this essay the whole project of practice realization, Dogen writes, very poetically, the wind of the house of Buddhism reveals the great earth's golden presence and ripens the sweet milk of the long rivers. That's the end. The whole line is, because the nature of the wind is constant, this constant change, this Im immeasurable dynamism, because the nature of the wind is constant, the wind of the house of Buddhism reveals the great earth's golden presence and ripens the sweet milk of the long rivers. This wind of the house of Buddhism this practice, this practice realizing. And the great earth's golden presence, the great earth's golden presence, Dogen is so clear, this, however you want to name it, this oneness, emptiness, constant change. Great Earth's golden presence ripens the sweet milk, the compassion, the sweet milk of the long rivers of suffering. This is what Dogen believes we're doing here. What this practice realization is. I 
especially like that word ripening. Ripening the sweet milk of the long rivers. That's a lot to go through to get to why practice. The Heart Sutra, we haven't been chanting it every day at this session because of the sort of, you know, trying to be mindful of the best practices around this virus. So, But it's familiar to many, this Heart Sutra, it says it so much more succinctly. You know, it starts out with this bodhisattva of great compassion. The bodhisattva who awakened to the absolute oneness of this existence. Great compassion. That bodhisattva is practicing deep prajna paramita wisdom beyond wisdom, this oneness, godness, constant change. Seeing that all is empty and resolving all suffering. How can our sitting here, as Henry so clearly, luminously, generously invites sitting and allowing, allowing whatever arises, allowing that spaciousness in a sense all around it, maybe in and through it. How can that resolve or dissolve all suffering, our own suffering and the suffering of the whole world. How can cultivating choiceless awareness, dropping all like and dislike and returning again and again, maybe 10,001 times a day or an afternoon. How can that address the first noble truth? There is suffering. How can our sitting in silent absorption activate the great earth's golden presence? and ripen the sweet milk of the long rivers. One of the miscellaneous koans, the collection of koans that in Sambo Zen we take up uh, after an initial, you know, some kind of opening, often with Mu. So there's a koan, one line in the form of a question. Why is it that the tears of a clearly enlightened person never cease to flow? So don't, let's not be hooked by that phrase, clearly enlightened. This is about this one body, the body of compassion. It's about you. In her commentary on the miscellaneous koans, I, as far as I know, the only published commentary, Elaine McGinnis Roshi recounts a story about a disciple of Hakuin Zenji, <clears throat> famous master. This disciple is a deeply awakened woman, known for her happiness and delight 
in life's festivity. All this festivity. This festivity. She had children who in turn had children. Such a joy. And as she aged, one of those grandchildren was just especially dear to her. When the child died suddenly, the old woman, the story says, wept and wept in her sorrow. The villagers were taken aback. How could this deeply enlightened person cry so much? There are others who have express something like this. One story um, that Scott was calling to mind last night, we were talking about this quietly, is of a um, group of students who were gathered around their dying master. And the master chides them. You're just here to see how a Zen master dies. I'll show you how. I don't want to die. How could you cry? The villagers say to the old woman. A master in her own right. How could you experience such grief? She responds, my every tear is a pearl that shines in full brightness. Every tear. Empty, boundless, shining, fully immersed, One bright pearl. So, some of you must know where I'm headed with this. You know, this woman who is a recognized disciple of Hakuin, Hakuin Zenji, lived 1686 to 1769. You know, she would have known the teaching of Wansha or Gensha, who some 700 years earlier presented the single pearl of his own experience, this remarkable master, Guansha, Guansha in the Chinese sort of Gensha, Japanese. Here's the line that he's known for. The entire world of the ten directions is one bright pearl. Or another translation, the entire universe is one bright pearl. Or throughout the entire universe, one bright pearl. I'm just guessing that this awake old woman knew this. Such a part of the fabric of this inheritance. Dogen clearly knew it. He devotes a whole chapter of his I Treasury of the True Dharma, this Shobo Genzo, this massive, amazing, volume of essays. The chapter is called One Bright Pearl. So just a word about Gensha. Um, he grew up in a fisher, family of fishers. So poor, illiterate, uh, 
And one day as a young boy, he's out fishing with his father. And, you know, it depends on the account you read, whether they, the water was rough somehow. The father, against his father, falls in, falls out of the boat. And he can't swim. Neither can Gensha. I think that this was sort of common, oddly, among fishermen. So Gensha just witnesses the death of his father, his drowning. Even so, Gensha goes on and becomes a fisherman. But then um, when Gensh is about 30 years old, this is, Dogen puts it this way, a golden scaled fish came to him unbidden, like this golden fish that just leaps into the boat. Such a perfect image for a fisherman. We, we might each ask, you know, what, what is it? What was it for me? That unbidden golden fish that put my feet on this path. Just enough suffering, maybe a lot. Fear of death. Worry of not enough, this troubled world. Without seeking it, the golden gift of Gensha's own dis-ease, this transient life, this great loss, the great uncertainty, it leaps into his boat. And Gensha follows that tug into a monastery. He becomes a disciple of Seppo, great master, who was also the teacher of Unman, or Yunmen, who we've been hearing about. After studying with Seppo for some time, Gensha sets out on a pilgrimage. Again, it depends on the account, but you know, this was the tradition. After a time in the monastery with your master, you set off on pilgrimage. Maybe he's had a glimpse and he's going out to hone his eye. Or another version, you know, maybe he's not quite getting the Dharma. And so he goes off to seek it. Um, whichever it is, he's clearly close to Seppo. And the night before he leaves, they have this ceremony, you know, with Seppo and the monks, and then Gensha sets off the next day, just walking in his straw sandals, walking on pilgrimage. And before very long, he hits his foot against a sharp rock, his big toe, and it just splits open. Blood gushes out. And somehow, in that searing pain, Gensha wakes up. He has a realization. You know, one way of putting it, I, I've, I've heard, you know, is if I don't have a body, where is this pain coming from? If there's, you know, nothing at all, what is this? You know, gone, vanished. This great vacancy. And yet, blood gushing from a wound. No experiencer, 
no trace of a separate self, and yet, this pain. Gensha sees emptiness, and he also sees compassion. He turns around and walks back. Just recall, Henry has this lovely um, short meditation with one bright pearl on the waking up app. And he, I think he says, Gincha hobbled back. Seppo greets Gincha with surprise. What's happening? Why are you back so soon? And for me, it's not what gets focused on, but Ginch's first words are telling. They're variously translated, but one version is, I will never deceive others. Or another is, I cannot deceive others. Or yet another is, I cannot be fooled. Mm -hmm. However you take it, there is no other. This one body, empty of any fixed substance and boundless. Nothing to divide, nothing outside it. Not a hair's breadth of separation. As Henry put it, not an eyelash. In that sourceless pain for Gensha, everything is laid bare. Intimate. Nothing to obscure, nothing to defend. There is no other and no self. No possibility of separation. This one dynamism, one vibrancy, one original love. We're all part of that. The unfettered fact of who he is. Seppo responds, who doesn't know these words, yet who else could say them? He says, Seppo, your traveling bag is packed. Why don't you go and study all around? And then Gensha answers, Bodhidharma didn't come to China. Huika, Eka, Bodhidharma's disciple, didn't go to India. There's this legend that after Bodhidharma, this great Bodhidharma, who brings Zen from India to China, you know, as a very, very old man, and sits facing the wall for nine years, that at the end, there, there are different versions of this legend, but some say Bodhidharma went back, but you know, he's 120. But some say Huika, Eka, went to India. So here again, she's saying, you know, like, like we heard, we've been hearing these last two days with Toza. You know, what are you doing wandering all over the place? I, you know, Bodhidharma didn't go anywhere. Eka didn't go anywhere. I can't leave. I've told this before, but there was this poignant moment at the end of a session a few years ago. It may have been the last time I saw Rian Roshi. And it had been, you know, just this beautiful week. So helpful. And we were in the dining hall for breakfast and he came in re clearly ready to leave. And, uh, you know, a few people gathered around and said goodbye. And when I came to him, I just, 
I, I didn't know what would come out, but I just said, Roshi, please don't leave. And he said, I can't leave you. <laughs> Henry said yesterday, we are not born in the sense that we assume. Sort of suddenly separate and independent or dependent in ways that can shore us up. And we don't die in the sense that we assume. One manifesting, coming up, constantly changing by nature, inexhaustible. There's one very well-known koan um, comes up a couple times in the collections we do that asks, how will you free yourself from life and death? Hyphens, life and death. At the moment you are about to die. Intimately. That's what Bodhidharma says to Eka Huika that actually triggers Eka's awakening. They're out walking in the mountains, and Bodhidharma says, which way shall we go? Eka's always up there. He knows the way, and Eka says, go straight on. And Dharma says, if you go straight on, you cannot take a step. You can't move. Ten directions. The entire world. Nothing outside it. And it's all right here. So in the record of Gensha's teaching, there is an exchange between Gensha and one of his monks all around this phrase, this teaching. Here's a version of it from Dogen. Some years, Dogen writes, some years after attaining the way, Gensha instructed his students, saying, the entire world of the ten directions is one bright pearl. Once a monk asked him, I have heard you said, the entire world of the ten directions is one bright pearl. How should I understand this? Gensha said, the entire world of the ten directions is one bright pearl. What do you do with your understanding? The next day, Gensha asks the monk, the entire world of the ten directions is one bright pearl. How do you understand this? And the monk says, the entire world of the ten directions is one bright pearl. What do you do with your understanding? And Gensha says to this monk, I see that you have worked out a way to get through the demon's cave on Black Mountain. Or in another translation, now I know that you are making your livelihood in the Black Mountain demon's cave. <laughs> this demon's cave on Black Mountain. It's often used as an expression for being stuck in emptiness or stuck in concepts. Any sense of separation. In this case, the monk is mimicking. There are two. For Dogen and for Gensha, that isn't a problem. 
It's a manifestation of the Dharma. The ten directions freely functioning, the one bright pearl rolling. It's that image of how freely it rolls, like in a silver bowl or just this vast bowl of the universe, this pearl. Like our practice, freely flowing, however it is. Demon's cave, demon's cave. Uh, Dogen has so much about this. Here's just a little nugget just to share and just let it wash over you. It's, that's what happens. This is from a Dharma Hall discourse. These, these are really short that Dogen entitles Holding the Universe in a Demon's Cave. He writes, Holding the entire universe in the ten directions. We take the first step. Holding the entire universe in the ten directions. We engage in practice. Holding the entire universe in the ten directions. We clarify mind. Holding the entire universe in the ten directions, we transform the activity of our bodies. Holding the entire universe in the ten directions, we reverse our way of thinking. The privilege of facing students one-to-one -one in this practice includes what is often a very touching transparency around suffering, the experience of loss, grief, despair, pain in the body, pain in the heart, and of course, also, the wonder of discovery, of beauty, ease, equanimity, acceptance, love. The refrain of suffering I hear the most in myriad variations. I'm not good enough. the lament, the lack, the lament of some failing, of not measuring up, of needing in some way to be other. Other than exactly this. One bright pearl blows through that misconception, engulfs it in a vast embrace, as wide as the whole, whatever size, one entirety. There's this passage in the Transmission of Light, the Denko Roku, from Master Kazan, where he's writing about this one bright pearl, and it's, it's evocative. I'll just quickly share it. He talks about the one bright pearl as a wish-fulfilling pearl treasure. And then he writes, this is Kazan, he's very clear, fantastic talks, this compilation, transmission of light. So he writes, if you put this pearl beside you when you are ill, the illness is cured. If you wear this pearl when you are worried, the worry will dissipate on its own. Using this pearl, one also manifests, he writes, supernatural powers and magical transformations. All treasures appear from this pearl, no matter how much it is used. 
It is inexhaustible. So Kazan, this points to the healing power of the pearl. But his language in this case is imprecise. Oh, I loved it when Henry held up the third and fourth paramita as um, patience and being precise. It's not that you put the pearl beside you. You are the pearl. It's not that you wear the pearl. That's you. Catch a glimpse of this one bright pearl. And illness and worry are intrinsically cured. say more, but supernatural powers, magical transformations, sitting, listening, clouds gathering, blue sky morning, living, dying. That dynamic capacity, intrinsic capacity, Dogen writes, when the entire body is the entire body, there is no hindrance. He says, it is gently curved and turns round and round. No hindrance. Heart Sutra, no hindrance of mind. Therefore, no fear. Constantly changing, myriad things, including pandemic, devastation of war, devastation of the ecosystem. You know, loss of species, including the cries of the world the beauty of nature, the fragility of our own heart, including your practice. And just one more word from Dogen. This being so, although you may say, I am not a bright pearl. You should not doubt. Whether you doubt it or not, Dogen says, such doubt comes from a limited view. Limited views are merely limited. Just as it is, this pearl and the tiniest bit of it is all of it. In yesterday's Q&A, someone asked a question about liking and disliking. Very helpful question. I like liking, the questioner said. It makes life more interesting. I don't want to stop picking and choosing. Henry quoted the opening Verses on affirming faith in mind. That line, the great way is not difficult. It simply dislikes choosing. It's one of Joshu's favorite teachings. We know from the koans that he often quoted this. The great way is not difficult. It simply dislikes choosing. This great way of practice realization We're always choosing, but the great way 
doesn't do that. It doesn't know what that is. In fact, it shows us that you cannot choose. Whatever you pick up, that's all of it. This one functioning. And that next line that follows this picking and choosing. When like and dislike disappear, the way stands clear and undisguised. Our likes, our dislikes, are immediately reflecting a separate, separating self. Let that drop. And there's nothing to hinder anything. This friend and wonderful teacher, John Gaynor, who I've mentioned, speaks about our practice as an exchange. He said, let go this choosing like and dislike and receive back this oneness, emptiness, and myriad. exchange, letting go, receiving back, letting go, receiving back. He says, it can't be forced. All you can do, all we can do, is let go liking and disliking. John says it will happen of itself. He's not alone. <laughs> If you really let go, it's happening, even if you don't know it. And then he speaks of this separate self, of this letting go, excuse me, John, as a transition from separate self to one self, this single entirety. Transition, transformation, dropping off, and yet, already so. Ten directions, one bright pearl. I'm going to finish now. I know the time is long. Uh, I just wanted to mention because it kind of comes up in my heart each time this phrase does now. A student who reached out um, not too long before COVID and the lockdown and didn't, you know, didn't know anything about Zen, but had somehow heard the phrase, one bright pearl, and burst into tears sort of like that golden fish leaping into the boat. My every tear is one bright pearl. So I want to end today um, with a poem that was just sent since we've been in retreat by another student. It's called The Face. And this student is, you know, not, I, I mean, there's no disclaimer needed, but it's, it's like one of us you know, writing. I mean, some of you may be wonderful writers. But um, here, here's the poem I was so grateful to receive. Against the wall, I face the face of compassion soft eye and gentle half smile, all that arises in my mind, all that arises in my body. The darkness, me, 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 and shame. The song that is stuck, the to-do list, the story about my mother, the regret, 
the joke I heard, the image of a past untold, the boredom, the need to stand up. Every single thing. Met by compassion, a soft mmm sound is all it says, no matter what. Mm. Maybe my practice, she writes, is to sit for long enough until I melt into a puddle of Met by compassion, a soft mmm sound is all it says, no matter what. Melt into moo. Just that. One bright pearl. Boundless compassion. And gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for this shared practice. The Four Vows of the Bodhisattva Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. The Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. The enlightened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it.